The vagus nerve is what I like to refer to as the expressway to calm. This long wandering nerve pathway is a two-way connection between the brain and body. The vagus nerve is highly active in our parasympathetic rest and relax system and runs from the base of the brain to and from our body, mostly between the throat, heart, lungs, and abdomen. When it's activated, the vagus nerve decreases our heart rate, slows our breathing down, and triggers the release of a calming agent called acetylcholine, which sort of acts like a break on the fight or flight system. The vagus nerve also sends information upward about the state of the organs. And it even has some branches that are involved in picking up and processing facial expression and vocal tone. So because of this, the vagus nerve plays a key role in recognizing the emotional state of another person. The gut information that the vagus nerve sends up to the brain is what we refer to as our gut feeling. Neuroscientists believe that these subtle cues are relayed from the gut as a way to avoid potential danger. If you're familiar with and highly attuned to this intuitive system, your gut feeling can be paired with judgment and critical thinking to help you make comprehensive choices. The ability to self-regulate your nervous system and calm yourself when you're having a strong emotional experience is closely tied to a person's ability to read their own internal body sensations. This skill is called interoception and it can be learned. So by learning to read your body sensations, not only will you strengthen your vagal nerve, you'll also be learning an essential skill that's needed to interrupt emotional activation patterns and retrain your stress response system. Stephen Porges is a professor of psychiatry who has done some really interesting research on the vagus nerve, and he's the author of Polyvagal Theory. His research suggests that there's an additional vagus nerve response pathway that activates if the primary response pathway fails or is overloaded. If the primary pathway gets overloaded, this less refined and more abrupt vagal pathway takes over, kicking off a sort of physiological freeze response. This interruption of the typical fight or flight response cycle often occurs during traumatic experiences. This interruption of the physiological body response is what is often referred to as emotion being held in the body. We'll go over trauma response more later, but here's my simple recap of polyvagal theory. When we come across a situation that is uncertain, we first look at facial expression, body cues, and try to socially interact in order to try and calm down or soothe our slightly activated nervous system back to a state of feeling safe and calm. But if that doesn't work, or the situation becomes too intense, and we can't take action and mobilize the adrenaline in the body, this vagal system pathway gets overloaded. That's when that secondary freeze pathway kicks in. Now, for some people, this translates to extreme nausea, fainting, or a complete blackout of memory. Now remember, regardless of age, an experience that is too much, too fast, and too soon is what the brain experiences as traumatic, in part because we can't take action or we don't know how to take action to move or talk our way out of a situation. Movement that would allow the emotional response in our bodies to come to an end or complete its neurochemical cycle. Biophysicist Peter Levine compares this response to the freeze or play dead response of an animal right after it's captured by a predator. He describes it sort of like a last ditch effort survival mechanism. Simply put, our emotional response cycles need movement, action or behavior in order to fully complete themselves. Sometimes we try to offload or drain adrenaline through screaming and yelling or crying or verbal outburst. It's not quite the same. 
So if we can't do that, if we can't physically move away from a threat, like a soldier at war, or when we're young and we just don't know how to, the emotional response system can get locked up or stuck, so to speak, in the state where it was interrupted. If this freeze response is prolonged in humans, a traumatized person can feel numb or lifeless, a condition often reported by survivors of abuse or neglect or by veterans with PTSD. So in order to reverse this physiological frozen state, gentle reconnection to our body sensations and emotional responses can help wake up a neurochemical system that was interrupted and had shut down kind of mid course. This guided reconnection provides the person an opportunity to reassess the safety of their current environment and to biologically complete that interrupted emotional response process. Once that happens, the formerly traumatized and frozen response system can begin to slowly warm up, so to speak, and reconnect to the healthier, more smoothly flowing pathway of the vagal response system. So how do we influence the vagus nerve? Deep diaphragmatic breathing is the quickest and easiest way to slow down our heart rate, activate our parasympathetic system, and put a break on the fight or flight system. So if you sense you're becoming emotionally activated, start with a few deep breath, breaths, like from your belly. Like if you put one hand on your chest and the other one on your belly, and first take one breath up here that expands your chest. Now take another lower, fully fuller breath that makes your belly kind of expand like this. That lower, fuller lung inhale, that the one that expands your belly, that's the one you want because it activates your diaphragm, which the vagus nerve connects to. So by activating your diaphragm with that deep, full breath, you activate the vagus nerve, which turns on that calming or breaking chemical in your body. This is why belly expanding diaphragmatic deep breathing is so effective. Social or community involvement can also increase your vagal strength. Positive relationships and support can activate the calming chemicals of the braking system more frequently. And lastly, learning to tune into our body sensations and then having an experienced trauma practitioner guide you to physically process these blocked or held emotional cycles can help someone who has experienced a traumatic event begin to complete that interrupted physiological process. Okay, so, so far in this class, we've covered some basic concepts about how the brain operates, and we've taken a look at six brain areas or hubs of the brain network that are the key players in breaking patterns and making lasting integrative and brain strengthening change. Let's quickly review these six areas again, along with the names that I gave them related to their role or function. Because in part four, I'm going to refer to these by their names more than like by their functional names, more than their scientific name. That way we can kind of put it all together in a more practical manner. Okay, here we go. The cerebral cortex is where most of our processing takes place, including problem solving, planning, and social interaction. So we're going to give it the functional name of the workroom. The anterior cingulate cortex, or the ACC, is a specific area of the workroom that notices differences that are not expected and has a threshold for activation. If it's given enough time, it can offer up intelligent behavior choices to manage conf conflicting differences without sending us into full throttle fight or flight response. So this area's functional name is the conflict manager. The reticular activating system focuses on specific stimuli that influence our arousal level. 
It also screens into our brain what we tell it is a priority or what we tell it is important to us. The functional name is the filter. Now the amygdala is very complex and has many roles, but two important roles are A, coordinating with several other areas of the brain during an experience, including memory registration and emotional response activation, and B, taking information provided by our senses and putting a context-dependent meaning label on it. Therefore, it has two functional names, the coordinator and the label maker. Now, the hippocampus works closely with the amygdala and is where memories are formed, organized, and encoded before being stored in memory. It also plays a role in shaping perspective. So its functional name is the packing and shipping center. The vagus nerve is the long wandering nerve system that connects the brain and the body. It helps us to read a person's emotional landscape by way of body language and facial expression. It helps to soothe our, serve, our nervous system and acts as a break to our fight or flight system. So its functional name is the expressway to calm. Now I wanna add one more brain area for the next section that we haven't talked about directly. It's the hypothalamus and it's part of the survival hub of the brain's network. Now, although we can't directly influence its operation, it's closely tied to many other brain areas, including the amygdala. Its job is to initiate the neurochemical and hormonal response of the accelerator system in your body. It's in charge of preparing the body just in case you need to move or act in some way. So the functional name I use for the hypothalamus is the body alert center. Now we're ready to take these simplified names and apply them so we can see how a healthy brain body response system is designed to work, how the brain creates thoughts and beliefs, and then see what happens when a traumatic event or even a simple misunderstanding interferes with these processes. And finally, we'll wrap up the class by talking about what we can do to start getting our brains and body back on track, recentered, and stronger so it can support the comprehensive, integrated, whole brain life that we want to lead. So take a short break if you need it. And then we're going to put it all together in part four.